What's up, students? Hope you're having the best day of your life today. Today, we are going to talk about an introduction to Newton's first law of motion, also known as the law of inertia. Exactly what it is, how it's often misrepresented, and some things that you really need to be specific about when talking about the first law of motion. I'll give you some examples of it in action. This is going to be good for anybody taking the SAT physics exam. AP Physics 1, 2, or C, it does not matter because this is a great foundation, as well as my home state, the New York State Regents exam. Let's get right into it, guys. So most commonly, I've heard that Newton's first law is said to be this. An object at rest will remain at rest, and an object in motion will remain in motion unless acted on by an outside force. And for a lot of people, that will do the trick. But there are a lot of holes in this definition that we really need to talk about and that are very, very important for us to understand, especially when we get to the higher levels of physics and we have to start explaining things that are happening on a specific object. So the first thing that I would fix is when I read this, I'd say an object at rest will remain at rest and an object in motion will maintain a constant velocity unless acted upon by an outside net force. This gives a much clearer picture of Newton's first law. Now let me explain. So if we look at the first part, if I have the ground and say a box, right now it's sitting at rest and it will remain at rest unless it's acted upon by an outside net force. Now, what the heck does net force mean? Well, just because the object is at rest does not mean there are no forces acting. So when I'm at rest, that does not mean that there's no forces acting. On this box right now, depending on where you're at in your course, you know that there is a force due to gravity that's acting on this box. But there's also the force due to the normal. And if you don't know what these forces are, you'll get to them eventually. But these forces are present on the box and it's still at rest. So I, I can't just say there's an outside force. These are This is an outside force that's acting on the box, but it's still at rest. It's the net force or an outside sum of these forces that makes the object change its state of motion. When the net force is equal to zero newtons, everything is going to stay constant as far as its motion is concerned. So for example, let's say I had a car. and That car was moving at a constant velocity of 10 meters per second. Now in this first definition, will remain in motion, will remain in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. That kind of tells me that if an outside force acts, it has to stop. Like what happens if it goes like this? And now it's a couple seconds later, it's moving at a constant velocity of five meters per second. Well, did it remain in motion? Yes. But did an outside force act on it? Yes. So we can't say that. What we need to say is we'll maintain a constant velocity unless acted upon by an outside net force. For it to go from 10 meters per second to 5 meters per second, an outside net force must accelerate this object and it no longer maintains a constant velocity. And it's also worth noting that velocity is a change in direction as well. So the speed can remain the same. But if the direction changes, there also had to be an outside net force. So remember, an object at rest will remain at rest, like this box, unless it is acted upon by an outside net force to get it moving. And an object in motion will remain at a constant velocity unless it's acted upon by an outside force. Because guys, once again, when this object is moving this way, there's still a force of gravity, and there's still a force of the normal acting on this, on this object, but it's still moving this way. The F net in this direction is zero. There's no acceleration. So once again, we can't just say a force acting. We have to say a net force. Let's look at some examples of this and why it's called the law of inertia. We know that inertia is just a resistance to want to change the state of motion. And quantitatively, we say that inertia is equal to an object's mass. So as mass goes up, inertia goes up. That is the only way to change an object's inertia. So this is a resistance to want to change. So when I'm at rest, that object has an inertia. It does not want to move. It resists change in motion. And when it is moving, it is also going to have an inertia, which means it's going to resist a change once again. That change only happens when F net comes along and moves it or slows it down. Now, this isn't something that's usually seen 
in a multiple choice type question, because like I said, if I want to ask for the inertia, all I have to do is change the mass. So sometimes you'll see which of these boxes has the greatest inertia, and you're just going to be looking for the one that has the greatest mass. Sometimes they'll try and trick you by throwing in a speed of that box. Inertia is only going to deal with mass. They are directly related. But this definitely comes up when you have to explain the state of motion of an object. So one example that I have seen asked to explain is the safety feature in a car. What safety feature in a car helps protect against a head-on collision? And a lot of times the first thing that people want to say is an airbag. Yeah, an airbag is great, but we don't always have airbags. The first thing that was put into a car was a seatbelt. Now, how does a seatbelt help fight against the law of inertia? Well, here, here's how. So here's a picture of you not drawn to scale sitting in a car. And like I said, you're not hovering. You get the idea. But if this car is moving with a velocity that's equal to, say, 50 meters per second, how fast are you moving? Well, if the car is moving 50 meters per second, that means the seat is moving 50 meters per second. And that means you are moving 50 meters per second. And you are going to continue to move 50 meters per second until you are stopped by an outside net force. You are going to remain at a constant velocity until you are stopped by an outside force. Well, now your car hits the tree and your car goes to zero meters per second. Now your chair is bolted to the floor of the car. So now your chair goes right to zero meters per second. But if you're not bolted to the chair, what's going to stop you? Either the steering wheel or the windshield. And that is not going to be good for you. The windshield is going to be the thing that stops you, not the tree. So what we do is we strap you to the chair. So now you're, the seat is bolted to the car. You're bolted to the chair, and then we're going to put a nice little happy airbag out here for your head to hit. That's the reason that we have a seatbelt. So this is for a head-on collision. Now, what about if you're rear-ended? Is there a safety feature for that? And the answer is absolutely. The safety feature for a rear-ended is this right here. This is the headrest. And it's very, very important that the headrest is adjusted properly. And it's probably one of the things that's overlooked the most in a car. And here's what I mean. So now you're chilling at a stoplight. You're listening to the newest Duh Baby song. And you're bolted to the chair and the chair is bolted to the floor. Now, you're not moving, so you're not really worried about a head-on collision. So right now the car has a velocity of zero meters per second. The chair has a velocity of zero meters per second, and you have a velocity of zero meters per second. And you are going to maintain that state of constant velocity, which is in this case zero, unless you are moved by an outside net force. Well, what happens when a truck comes and rear ends you? The truck then is going to apply an outside net force, and it's going to move the car at 20 meters per second this way. Well, the chair is bolted to the floor, so now it is going to move 20 meters per second this way. And all of this part of your body, that is also connected to the car. And what it is going to do, it is going to move at 20 meters per second. But now what's going to get left behind if nothing pushes your head with your body? Nothing. So what's going to end up happening is when you're rear-ended, if you don't have a headrest, your head gets left behind because it's still staying at zero meters per second because of the law of inertia. And your body is way over here because it just got moved by being rear-ended by a truck. Well, you see your neck is going to go through a bunch of damage. So what we do is we put a headrest right here. So that when the chair pushes your body forward, the headrest comes and it moves your head forward at 20 meters per second, putting less damage on your neck. There are examples of the first law of motion being used all over your car. If you've ever wondered why sometimes your seatbelt, it tightens up at certain points and you can only pull it. Every time your seatbelt feels a change in motion, it locks your seatbelt. So when you press the gas, it's going to lock the seatbelt. 
When you press the brake, it is going to lock the seatbelt. When you're maintaining a constant velocity, your seatbelt will become unlocked. Hope this video helped explain the first law of motion. The next video, we'll check out the second law and also the third law as well. If you have any questions, guys, please leave them in the comments down below and give the video a like if it helped you in any way, shape, or form. Until I see you on the next one, guys, stay positive. Always work really, really hard and be kind to other people. I'll catch you on the next one.